active learning practices, but first year experiences and seminars, learning communities, which our university is trying to use uh, as a whole, trying to use seminars as that cohort building. For us, it's much easier because we don't, we bring in maybe 45 to 50 uh, freshmen. And so we put them in one seminar and now we have a cohort. And they're, they're getting the same information from one instructor. Undergraduate research, very important. And then uh, community-based service learning, very, very important. Uh, then he also says that the high impact activities and deep learning uh, in the freshman year are the, the items that will yield the best, best um, success for students are learning communities and service learning. And then as you get into the senior years, service learning, giving back somehow is a, a very good uh, uh, activity in terms of they self-report, but this is something that's really going to help that student finish. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of research that says freshman year, difficult to keep them. And junior or senior year, difficult to have them finish, even though they're so, so close to the end, because most may have families, most may have uh, the, this, this um, inflationary period in our society is very difficult on, on minority students, it's difficult on everybody. But uh, for them, it's, it's very difficult. Sometimes they have to take a semester off, come back. So uh, what I noticed when I came, I came in 2009, and uh, after a, a two years, I noticed that um, student, we would recruit, you know, February through June, and we'd get a cohort that were gonna come in. And then June came, and they come to our math experience, which was a two week program. And then we wouldn't see them at all until the last week in August where we had our start program. And half of them were gone. They, you know, they're accepted to many schools and they leave in between. And so what we tried to do with the preemptive uh, prelude activities was let's touch them, not physically, but let's touch them uh, so that we keep track of them and help them see the advantages our university will offer and our program will offer. Uh, so that's what we did. And uh, some of the things we have incorporated and with more grant money, we've incorporated extensively. And I'll give you an example. So math preview, review, so we bring them in uh, to review uh, a pre, uh, college algebra, pre-cal, calculus one. And, and we'll have one math instructor do that. And then, we will uh, explain that all over again, believe it or not, the hard areas they don't get. And then they'll take a uh, placement exam, a bypass exam. And, you know, she's very good. Uh, Ms. Nakamura, Professor Nakamura is very good. She, if they are not solid, she will not let them take the test. And, but, but they're better placed because incoming, they all have calculus for the most part from high schools. And so what do they get placed in? Because we don't take the SAT anymore. I do, but I mean, for our program, we take it. But the general university doesn't take it. So how do they place? Well, they have to take the Theo or the uh, TSI. In Texas, it's called TSI. And so they're going to be put in college alpha. Or in some cases, remedial. We actually had a student that's a freshman, had a, I don't know, like a 1170 in remedial. And when I saw that, you know, I'm calling the advisor saying, and I'm calling the student and I'm saying to the student, you need to go retest for that TSI because you don't need to be there. You shouldn't be there. And so the, she did retest, she did very, very well. And so she got moved into a uh, pre-cal or whatever, wherever she needed to be. And the problem is, to some degree, nobody's saying things like this to them because they don't have just 45. They may have 1,200 that they're bringing in or maybe bigger universities even more. So who is, who is monitoring? Was it they didn't test well or their SATs weren't high enough? Or what is it that we can do to get them up to speed and not to try to accelerate so much, 
but to get them where they truly belong in terms of a, a possibility or uh, what they do now, right? And then in, in uh, the end, of, so that takes two weeks. In the end of June through the end of July, we brought in, we call them research days. And those have, and that was where we would bring them in uh, for about uh, two days each week. And we had 10 to 12 professors open their labs and show them around. They have their undergraduate research student, students do experiments for them. And then we, give them pizza, you know, you gotta feed them and then, and then go to the next two labs. So they do four labs per day and they do that for a week. Now we since have changed that and we do a summer bridge program because we have money. And so uh, they will come in and be in a, in a what, what some would call, if you were in computer science, they call it an affinity group, but it's the same everywhere. You have a senior undergraduate working with a professor and then you have undergraduates that are lower division, and then you have the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the incoming uh, FTICs. And so they will work together. And that's a wonderful situation because they see the research possibilities and they also get to meet students at that university that have made it. They are now in their sophomore, junior, senior year. And so they can tell the tale. Right. And then finally, uh, in August, the beginning of August, we put together a student parent uh, colloquium and dinner. We got to feed people and they bring, we do not limit. Now in COVID, we, the, at the end, we're still in COVID, but at the end of COVID where we went face to face, we limited them to two people, to their parents and one other. But usually we have Full families, I'll see grandparents there. It's amazing the pride that they have in their students going to school. It's what you want to see, and you want to honor them for having the good judgment coming in the university. But anyway, and so we feed them, and then we put on a, a, a program. We tell them what some of the things to expect from Scholars Academy. We bring in, if you look back there, I have three students, four students that are that are presenting in a little bit, and uh, we'll have peer mentors talk to them about the different facets. So I'm not telling them, you know, at a elderly age to young age, it's peer to peer, and somehow how they say it is so much more effective than how I say it, but it works, and uh, it, it's been very successful. And then finally, uh, the last part of the prelude is the START program, and so we offer again, it's a one week. It started out as a two week. That was really unsustainable. That was before my time. And uh, so we've kept it at one week and they come from 8.30 till four, feed them breakfast, feed them lunch, give them snacks. And then they're communing amongst all the cohort of the freshmen. Now for a large university, could you scale that? Absolutely you could right, if you needed to. And uh, then what are they learning? Well, that's that, that's that. Okay, and I've already said this, so we won't do that. Okay, and I've already told you this. Uh, now, one thing that the START program does for the FTIC, it, uh, it really brings all the different cultures that come to UHD. So we're very diverse and still first generation, but very, very diverse. And so they get to know somebody. And this is just critical. Even though you're doing the orientation in the large university, it's a one day, right? And they're not with the same people necessarily. They're going to go observe a, a, a lesson and then they go about to another room and then they eat lunch. They don't know anybody. Maybe they have a professor there to eat lunch with. So at our start program at the dinner, we have uh, faculty mentors that sit at the different tables. I, I never have to really uh, call too hard because they come, they know the importance of it. And then the peer mentors will sit at the tables 
And so this is a chance while they're eating and they're not thinking about questions they want to ask, but they're very at ease because they're eating and our students start to talk to them and to the parents and they ask the hard questions that they want to hear the students answer because the student is the one attending the university. They have an idea of what I will say. So at, at another thing that we do in the, in the start week is we have a segment on problem solving and comprehension. We do a pre-test and a post-test and we have 22 years of that to tell, uh, and, and it really informs the instructor of the seminar, who is the same person that's running the START program. Now, I play a little bit of a role in there, but I do the transfer seminar. I don't really do the freshman seminar. And then we introduce them to technologies. I'll show you that in just a minute. They create a Scholars Academy commercial, and I'll show you why that's important. And then they start their big research project for the seminar. It's called Movie Project. So uh, the problem solving, we, get, we use uh, Wimbley and Lockheed as a uh, basis for test, pre-testing and then post-testing because some of the technology information is going to incorporate problem solving exercises that Wimbley has and then we'll post-test them. And uh, that, that will be about a two hour to half a day that they're going to do that. Uh, so they each get a book and they go through it with her and ask questions and then she'll do individual math. And then again, the pre and post. Oh, well, this is very heavy. Okay, so on technology, I'm gonna kind of summarize it for you. So they'll use a GI-92 calculator, even though they've had that in, in a high school, uh, but they're still gonna use it. And, and she has a partitions math professor, so she has a particular project. And then uh, they'll also, uh, where's the other one? They'll use Excel and they'll analyze different, uh, for example, this one is rainfor rainforests are shrinking. And so create a scatter plot, plot adding a trend line from data they find on the internet about this topic. And then they'll also uh, do another Excel, creating a formula. So many students come in, they know math, they never used Excel. They don't know how to create formulas and fashion them themselves. So that's the beginning of uh, algorithms that they're going to need for e either computer science, mathematics, statistics, uh, and they do something with the rabbit population. And then she'll introduce ma maple software. Now, I could go on and on. I won't. We do a So that's about a day. And then I do a day. I come in and do a day of science experimentation in the bio biological area. You know, they've all had biology to get out of high school and they come in like it's a new world. You know, some haven't, they, they haven't used a balance. They haven't learned about density in chemistry. They all take chemistry. So it's very incredulous to me, but it's very, it's hands-on. This is also hands-on. And for freshmen, that's very important. Okay, and then they uh, get, they're in groups, they're put in groups by our uh, Miss Nakamura. And she's from Japan and she has a wonderful way. She can say things in such a wonderful manner. And so she'll take five words in Japanese and she'll make these, the groups. And they'll all get in there and they'll stay in there for that week and then the next semester. Uh, and Anyway, they will, will decide what movie they want to watch amongst, it, I don't know, a thousand that we have. And uh, it's got to be kind of scientific, right? Like Galactica was really like, was the main one, right? But now it's uh, Robotron or uh, what's that one? They change the robots change into cars. Yes, you know what it is. Anyway, yes, and so you know the the, the premise is, uh, what well, is this possible in real life? And so they don't go into that. They just decide which movie, and then write their questions, and then that goes over, flows over into the first semester. First semester, they're together. So it's really very effective. So they will at the end, uh, they will. 
go through the whole semester doing research. She'll check. They also have a peer leader that checks. And then they'll uh, put together a poster presentation. So they're working on soft skills. They're working on team building and they're working on uh, oral presentations. And so she'll critique both of those at different times. Same with the commercial. Okay. And then, okay, we'll go on about that. But they learn about the Scholars Academy as well. So peer-led team learning. How many of you have it at your campus? Anyone? Yeah. Man. That is a powerful tool. I mean, we all have SI, I know that. So peer-led team learning began as a methodology to what we used to call, what we call tutoring. I noticed uh, four years ago, so we had two grants that were paying for uh, support of the trainees in the PLTL method. And we gave them at the end a post-leadership uh, um, survey. And what we've seen is that they are developing leadership through this PLTL workshop. And we can see it because not only are they coming into our leadership stream, they are going into the UHD leadership stream as well. And now if we had more students, we, we'd help more. And we've offered the SI uh, new director, we, we actually invited her to let us, can we do a, a, a session for you? And, but we, and she, she let us, but we've not had any, any individuals come in and get it. We offered to pay them if they would come into the workshop because it really is a, it's a more Socratic method and it's very helpful. So we assign, we, we train our uh, peer leaders and we assign them to different groups in the seminar class. And they stay with them the entire semester. We pay them a stipend for training. They're learning how to be leaders there also, but we want to be, make sure they are trained before. Okay, one minute. Okay, 10 minutes, I'm sorry. And then, and then the thing about PLTL is active learning. Right. So instead of just telling, tutors tend to tell an answer instead of having the individual who does not understand think through it, reason through it, so that they learn how to think on their own. And uh, so the freshman seminar, the way the way we do, you know, we actually have them go out in the first semester. Uh, we have them go and do a community service project. And I've been told this was 10 years ago. Oh no, freshmen can't do that. They're not, right? They're not capable. It's too much for that freshman semester. It is a lot, but we give them time, right? In our class and they go and we focus on uh, middle school STEM. When they are doing, and we go out and we find, they find the middle school age students wherever they can find them. And generally it's a school, but it's not always a school. Sometimes it's boys and girls clubs. And they go and they, uh, they put together a matrix of the TEKS, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, so that we're not off base, so that the teachers or principals that we're going to, the kids are going to say, oh, you thought about this. Right. And so they they select those experiments that will support those particular uh, arenas. And then they come back and present and we give we do collect service hours from that. So uh, the seminar is very jam packed, a lot to do, a lot to learn for the freshmen. But they're the main thing is they are in cohorts. They're in their small group and then the larger uh, Scholars Academy. Uh, okay, so I want to go back. So this is the impact of the service. Now, this was in 2014, and we would find almost the same results because we have to do service learning in a certain way, and it's under the Office of uh, Student Engagement and Service. So we have to do it a certain way. They do their own uh, post-survey. You know, we don't see the results of that. I never see the results of that. But nonetheless, 
I would think this is pretty close to what we would find, right? That most find it, they don't want to do it initially, but when it's over, they, they feel good. They've served groups of people, and that's what we want. And now I'm going to go back just really quickly. Well, let me just, so look at some of the words, you know, when, because we asked some open-ended questions, and, you know, they feel accomplished, cultural awareness, right? We're talking about HSI, MSI, and they're developing cultural awareness, which they brought with them. But for other cultures, motivating others towards STEM, people skills, I mean, that's one thing STEM really needs, communication and people skills. And actually, probably all university people need that, right? Teamwork, organizational skills. Okay, I want to go back real quick to this so you can see um, some of the data. Okay, so this was collected by Ms. Nakamura. Um, in 2016, and you can see that uh, while the numbers we brought in were very small, uh, I came in in 2009 and, and I said, we need more freshmen. That's how, the, <laughs> that's how the data is calculated for graduation rate and for retention. So we need more. And we, you can see that incremental, incrementally we increased it. And you can see that our retention rate for SA has been fairly good. Now, uh, I have a presentation Saturday for FYE in California, and I've completed the data, and it, it's quite amazing when you look at a 22-year period of retention, right? Is it 100%? No. Is it 90? It's very close, very close to 90. And uh, even though we have smart students, you know, they have to have a 3.0 to come in. It's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't translate. That doesn't translate into learning the things you need to, to know. So you have to help them. Okay, and just to give you some idea of the service projects that we do. And they're very fun. I mean, they're simple, but they love them. And, uh, I think this, this particular one over here was a boys and girls club. It depends. Sometimes they find this was a, a middle school next to the university that they went to. Okay, so prelude activities. I'm sure you have your own, but if you've not thought about them, I mean, we always think about them, but intentionally, what will I do during those three months for the most part, before uh, fall semester starts. And I, I believe that if you will uh, really intentionally devise things for the month, you will you could see a change in how many stay. But I mean, you've got to be collecting the data. That's the other thing, too. You know, you're not guessing. Especially when you have 2,000 coming in, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. But I think you could do it. Okay, any questions, anybody? How about in the audience, virtually? In the audience first. Okay, in the audience? Oh, yes, ma'am. I actually have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so my first question, you might have touched this, but I probably missed it. Um, the students that are selected for these kinds of programs or activities, are they selected or do they opt into them? Well, they apply. It's a... It's an application process. You know, what do they have to have? Now, we say they have to have a 1040. We just raised that two years ago, right? On the SAT or equivalent on uh, ACT or equivalent on TSI. So we have a multiple way to determine, are they, are they able to do this? Work well, they're able because the university brought them in, but we want a little bit higher. We want a 3.0, okay. right? And most students coming out of, I mean, top 50% for the most part have 3.0, 2 9, 3.0. And then we have a, a, a faculty review committee. And so we'll blind and just give them the details that they need to look at, and they'll say, uh, well, this one 
has a very good SAT, but two nine. We might consider bringing them in or have them take a mini course or something and reapply, right? They'll, they'll or they'll say, no, let's wait and have them apply another time. But we're pretty, I mean, we, we bring in, uh, in general, now we're talking about FDIC and transfers. So we bring in almost 60 to 75 people every semester. We bring in some FDICs, but it's their first time in, but on, in the uh, spring semester. So we don't offer our FDIC seminar except in the fall semester. So we put them into our transfer seminar. And it'll count. Okay, did I get your question? Yes, you got my question. Then my second question was when COVID hit, did you see a dip in um, students of, like students interested in the program? And if so, how did you get them re engaged? Like, did you see any effect in engagement? With right. Students? Well, actually, our enrollment was pretty good because they love online. <laughs> we saw the dip when we went back to face-to-face, -face, almost 65% face-to-face, mm -hmm. and especially in the sciences because it's tough to do chemistry. I mean, you can do it. We presented last year on two professors and how they did virtual mentored research, right? It's very, uh, very interesting how they did that, but that's another topic. So, um, the recruiting, I think, was the hardest. We would, admissions had virtual sessions. We would, they would tag us and we'd go in with them, speaking to the larger group. And then uh, we would have, because we're, you know, 23 years, 22 years old, we've got some legacy things happening where members of the family are word of mouth. And we, we, we tell all the people who had applied come to this session, right? If you know people that don't know about it, tell them to come to this session so we can have multiple sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo, this was great. So is your first year seminar a required course for all? It is now. It when is we now. first okay. started, uh, I want to say 2014, 2014, it was not. Now, Scholars Academy, they had to take the seminar as a cohort. Since two, but way before, I think 2006, they pulled them out of the regular college success program and put them together. So we had an advantage that we were doing it already, and they don't, they don't hinder us. I mean, the bigger so, university doesn't hinder. So your pre students, who you said their recruitment was the hardest part, then they are integrating into their first year yes. seminar. The students who didn't make it to the prelude, but who were in the first year seminar, do they get an opportunity to do the prelude the next summer? No, we, no, because they're already sophomores. If, I mean, if they're able to, so they have to be ready. Yes, for us, yes. Now we do, okay, and we don't mandatorily make make them come, right? We have some that still won't bring their parents and won't come for the free dinner, and we try to make the dinner very attractive. But you can't, you know. But what we noticed there is if they don't come, the people who don't come to these activities, you can see a disconnect. It's, it's harder in the first semester for them to get to be long, get there. So that, right? was, that was what I was getting to, the distinction between your prelude and the first year versus first year alone in terms of successful progression and retention. What's that to the delta? Do we know? Uh, I would say, well, given the retention rates, even at the, only the first six years that we have, uh, I would say there's no difference because here's the thing. I'm not sure if the prelude, I, I'm not sure I can say the prelude activities are going to increase retention. They're, they're going, for us, the premise was they're going to keep people in the flow to the university that that was but i will say this having getting ready for my other presentation i do think that you know there is a scale and a survey for a sense of belonging which is a very new i don't think it's new if you were a sociologist you'd be working on it but for for universities to look at that to increase it to help retention and graduation 
uh, that's an interesting concept. But I think that if you look at retention after that first semester, you could almost generate a belonging number because if, they, if you're retaining them, they're there because they feel they belong or they would be out. That's anecdotal, but we are going to start to look it's at a it. Year of boot camp, actually. It's sort of like a boot camp, but it's a three month so that we can get them in. And I believe, so we have more, we have some other grants where we bring in the pre-college for the uh, five week research program. And we put them and the FDIC and the, and we really asked initially the FDIC, they were going to come to UHD. And then we ask other pre-college and we don't, the FDIC transition nicely. The pre-college that, that they want an experience so they can go to, you know, anybody, a and M, U T, anybody, right? So they can say, look, I've been to a research, and they'll go, oh, we want them, right? They don't necessarily transition to us, but we still offer it because it's it's a good thing. We'll get a few. Thank you for that question. Okay, anybody else? Andrew, a quick question, and yes. congratulations on your success. Thank you. I'm uh, Ken Adams from LaGuardia uh, Community College up in New York. Thank you. Um, Talk a little more about the service learning. I mean, this, you showed a picture, and then you showed some survey data from students about the impact of service learning. Yes. How long is how long are those assignments, and what were the assignments that had the biggest effect on students? Right. You know? Well, I'll tell you what I do in my class. She because I brought it over to her, and I said the freshman <laughs> seminar teacher, and I said, okay, I want you to do this, and she was all for it. Uh, but so what I do is. Um, you know, you put them in groups. And then I have peer leaders in my course also. And then we say to them, here's the big outcome that we want. We want you to find an entity or two if you need. We want at least 200 to 300 impact. Are you with me? I mean, anybody can do one class with 12 or 24. That's not enough. We want big. And then... Uh, and then we, we tell them, okay, you brainstorm as a group. Who do you want? Where can you go? Who do you know? It, because it's very hard to get into public schools now and private. And you make them think out of the box with the boys and girls clubs and, and other, you know, Boy Scouts of America and their big jamboree or whatever, they, not the one, you know, that's outside the state, but anyway. Uh, and then I and she make them do a matrix of here are the here are the members here are the teeks so the members read through the of the group read through the teeks uh, the essential knowledge and skills and we generally do it for science because it's hands on I have had groups that just insisted on doing math and I okay I can live with that make it hands on and and then justify why. We're doing what we're doing. Does it fit the team? And then this is a document they have. They don't contact anybody until they have the document approved by me and say, no, you cannot use acid, hydrochloric acid. No. All the chemists want to take the, you know, tough stuff. So find a way to do it with kitchen chemistry. You can't hurt people. And so they do because they're bright. And then they uh, they start contacting A, B, sometimes C. And some groups get too energetic and they'll, you know, you contact this and you contact this and you contact this. And I said to them, okay, now by doing this simultaneously, you may have to go to all three places because you cannot let somebody down who says yes, because then you hurt the name of the university. And uh, <clears throat> so they work through all that they have to do. That we purchase all the, the supplies. Everything has to be hands on. And then they, they go and they're there for three hours. Sometimes it's a STEM night and they get the parents. And I, it's a PR piece for UHD and the Scholars Academy. I mean, for me, that's the bang for the buck. But for the students that they're trying to uh, excite, about STEM, because it's hands-on hands 
and we do make it take it where we can, then they really like it. And that's a, and then I do a post test after that. I hope that answers it, but to Thank some you. degree. Thank you. Now, if you all will go, <clears throat> if you have, want more questions about the leadership, how we do leadership, I have a University of New Mexico a mentoring conference, I have several papers that have been accepted and presented, and you can find out more there. And so, uh, you know, we do something on service learning impact, and I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank y'all. Great audience. If you are uh, people like me you now, and I'm, I'm, you get this uh, this uh, uh, presentation, but if you'd like to email me and talk more, uh, and I'm here until late, not late tomorrow, but late.